Five to ten minutes early, you'll have an invitation back. I know it's at about 45 minutes, so we'll take all of that. No. no I, I kid you, but it was, it was an honor to be asked to come back. And on my way here, this has nothing to do with my sermon whatsoever, but it was just fascinating to me. I love turtles. I don't know why. I think they're fascinating. On my way here, I saw 20 turtles crossing the road. Now, I was avoiding them. I don't want to hit a turtle. And I was looking at the cars behind me, and we were all just swerving all over the road on the way down here, avoiding all these turtles. So if someone could explain to me later why you have so many turtles in Nancy County, it is baffling to me. It has nothing to do with my sermon whatsoever, but just an interesting fact, I guess. The title of my sermon today is Take the Step. And when you leave here today, when you walk out these doors, this is the one thing I want you to learn, or one thing I want you to grasp, wrap your mind around, that you can have success, you can be successful by taking the step of faith that God is asking you to do. You can be successful in taking the step of faith that God is asking you to do. Now that is a loaded sentence, and we're going to look at how that sentence can be true. And to do that, we need to turn to Matthew chapter 14. Matthew chapter 14, starting in verse 22. Matthew chapter 14, starting in verse 22. And this is a very familiar passage. Jesus walking on water. Jesus walking on water. About a week or so ago, I was actually in Michigan at a graduation. And we left on a Thursday, came back on a Sunday, and that averages eight hours of driving every day. And I have a one-year-old and a six-year-old. And the crying amount to about 20 minutes total. I was very, very blessed. But my daughter, we're at a hotel, and they had a pool. And my daughter, I'm looking at my other daughter, and my oldest daughter says, I'm walking on water. And I see her jump into the deep end. And her little feet going, and I'm like, I'm not in the deep end right now. I must get over there because she cannot walk on water. <laughs> but she she just walked on water, and I thought, how interesting that we always think about walking on water. You know, they got music videos that they, they put a piece of plexiglass under just an inch of water, and it looks like they're walking on water. We're fascinated. When I lived in Israel, I lived right on the Sea of Galilee. And they were doing some kind of documentary at the beach that we would go to often. And there was this guy dressed up as Jesus walking on the water. And I was just like, how are they doing that? I know he's not walking on water. And what he did, he had stilts on, strapped on his feet, and he was walking. And it was just fascinating. But we are fascinated walking on water. And this, because of this story has gotten a lot of attention, and what I want to do today is I want to look at this story, look at the details of the story, and then how it applies to you and I. So let's read together. You can follow along as I read. Matthew 14, starting in verse 22. Immediately, he made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he dismissed the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But the boat by this time was a long way from land, beaten by the waves, for the wind was against them. And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, It is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. <coughs> he said, Come. So Peter got off the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and began to sink and cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand, took hold of him, saying to him, O oh, you of little faith, why do you doubt? And when they got back in the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. Let's pray. Father God, as we dig into your word, 
as we search your word to see how it applies to our lives, open our hearts, open our minds, take the distractions of the day away so we can focus on what you want us to do through the reading of your word. Amen. I want to encourage you that when you hear me preach, when you hear me speak, don't take my word for it. Search the Bible yourselves. I'm going to be going over a lot of verses today, so I want you, one, to encourage you to take your notes right down the verses. So that way you can go home later, look the verses up, and see what I'm saying is accurate. And two, test me. Always test me. It is not the person standing behind the pulpit. You should never trust the person you're standing behind the pulpit. Trust the Word of God. I'm going to be going over a lot of verses. We're returning to the pages often. So please take some notes, write down the verses so you can look later to make sure what I'm saying is accurate. Uh, Paul praised the Bereans saying, you didn't take my word for it. You searched the scriptures and because of that, that is great honor for you. And I encourage you to do the same. And what I want to do right now is I'm going to take verse by verse where we look at each verse individually, choose one section of that verse to look at it to see what it's talking about so we can have a fuller picture of this story. And the first verse is 22, and it says that he sent his disciples away. When I read that, my question is, why did he send them away? What were they doing beforehand? Where were they going? And what just happened is in Matthew 14, starting in verse 13, we have the feeding of the 5,000. This is one of the feedings, and we think 5,000, that's pretty amazing. But that's just men, not including women and children. Now, when you include the women and children, you're looking at ten to 12,000 people that Jesus <laughs> fed with some loaves and some fish. And the disciples were handing this out. And so this is an all-day process. They're going to be exhausted by the end, because that's a lot of loaves and fish to carry around for almost ten to 12,000 people. Where did Jesus send them? He sent them five miles to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. At the time, they're at the site of Julius. And where that is? On the Sea of Galilee. That's really all we really need to know. That they're on one side of the Sea of Galilee, and then they're going to Capernaum, which is five miles away. Now, if you're looking at the map, what that means is that they were on the east side of the Sea of Galilee, going to the west side of the Sea of Galilee, at the very top of the Sea of Galilee. The time, it was in the evening, it was between 6 and 9 p.m., and this is based solely on verses 15 of Matthew 14 and verse 23. So this is what we're looking at. Twelve tired disciples. It is evening, and they have to go five miles to the other side of the sea. It's a wonderful night. They're on a mountaintop. They're seeing a wonderful miracle. But now they're going to have to get in their boat and row to the other side. Verse 23 says this. It says, and he dismissed the crowds, and he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. So this is what we see. Jesus just sent the crowds away, and he needed time to himself. He needed alone time. Now, many of us like alone time. I know that my wife, every so often, after a hard day at work, says, you know what, There's, I need to be by myself for about ten minutes. And... She just goes into the room, shuts the door, 10 minutes later comes out refreshed. Jesus did a major miracle, and he needed to refresh himself with the Lord. And this is seen in Mark 1.35, Luke 5.15, Hebrews 5.7, and many other verses where it says that Jesus went off to pray by himself. So we're seeing a kind of a dual picture, a dual story almost. You have the disciples going off in a boat, then you have Jesus going off by himself. They're both on two separate tracks, but they will meet together for a glorious encounter. Then, in verse 24, it says that the disciples were in the middle of the sea. It says, but the boat by this time was a long way from shore, or from land, beaten by the waves, for the wind was against them. When I lived on the Sea of Galilee, one thing that we were told is we have to be careful. If we're out in a field, and all of a sudden the wind picks up, we immediately have to get back inside. And I'm like, oh, you know, I lived near the ocean growing up. And I, every weekend I was on a boat in the ocean. I, I know when a storm's coming. The Sea of Galilee is a giant hole. 
you're surrounded by mountains. So what would happen is a storm would roll off a mountain and immediately just swirl around. And you had about 10 minutes before it gets bad. And I was in the banana fields picking some bananas. And all of a sudden, the wind picked up. And I'm like, ah, about a couple minutes before I need to worry. Next thing you know, it was black, torrential rain, wind. And it was, it was scary. And so imagine the disciples. It's a beautiful night. They're in the middle of the lake. They're about three miles out. So they really can't turn around. They just have the issue of just going forward. But the wind now is straight against them. The waves are going the opposite way. They're making no headway. And they've been up all day. They're tired. And it just is a horrible situation. They, the word here, it says tossed. The word in the Greek really translates tortured. It's not, oh, it's a little wavy. They were being tortured by the sea. And if you've ever been in a storm when it's really bad and you're outside, you're using all your strength to get from point A to point B. So these guys are really struggling right now. And this is all day and all night now that they're just moving forward, not being able to stop. Then in verse 25, we find out how long they've been struggling with this, with this storm. It says that the fourth watch. Now we think fourth watch, we don't really think much of it but it's between 3 and 6 a.m. So that means they've been on a boat for about 10 to 12 hours. Now, I've, just, I've done a lock-in before with youth. And you know, you're up all day getting ready for a lock-in. But then, you're up all night. And by 2 in the morning, that's when it gets really bad. That's when you're tired, you're exhausted, the kid comes up to you, she said she didn't like my hairstyle. Man, I don't like your hairstyle. I, it's just ugly. Don't call me ugly. And you're just sitting there going, huh? What? You don't really, you can't grasp what's going on. It's just, you're exhausted. You're mentally dumb. Imagine 12 guys, all fishermen, for the most part. They all have their own idea how to get through the storm. They're tired, they're exhausted, and they're making no headway. They're not just sitting in a boat. Well, Peter, if you just row a little faster on that side, I don't think that's what's happening. Right? Like, row, Peter! Come on! Put your back into it! Matthew, don't even. You're a tax collector. You just man to sail. Peter, don't tell me what to do. John, can you deal with this, please? I mean, this is a bad situation for them. And they're exhausted. They're at their wit's end. And then it says, um, verse 25, Jesus went to them. Jesus starts strolling through the storm. Now this isn't some magical, the seas are calm or parting and Jesus is walking through the water. There's a storm going on, so Jesus is walking up and down the waves and he's coming towards them. And in verse 26, it says this. And then the disciples saw that Jesus walking on the water and they were terrified and said, it is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. You know, we read that, but we don't really grasp what's happening. In the Greek here, the cried out in fear, is more of a panic and run. They're terrified. I'm afraid of the dark. Now, there's two reasons I'm afraid of the dark. One, I can't see in the dark. If I take off my glasses, I walk into walls. Only at night. During the day, I'm fine. And last night, I had to go put a milk away that we left out at the end of the night and I had my flashlight well, I, when I left the kitchen I turned my flashlight off not thinking and immediately ran into the wall <laughs> yeah, I just missed the doorway it, just, it happens <laughs> at night I can't see every so often you have that you know shirt hanging up and you walk and forget it's hanging up and you whoa <laughs> oh no just shirt I'm good we, we, we get that surprise but we recognize it's a shirt. You know, driving alone at night <clears throat> and through a cornfield, it's not like, wow, this is wonderful. We're like, oh, I hope nothing hops out of this cornfield. You, then all of a sudden you see that one person walking outside, or oh man, what is that person doing? It scares us. Imagine being in the middle of the ocean or the sea, and all of a sudden you see something walking on the water towards you. 
You're not going, oh, I wonder what that is. Let's go throw over there. You're like, oh, here it is. This is it. This is the end. You are freaking out at this point. The word panic and run. They're trying to get away from this. They are scared out of their minds. They're saying, guys, it's a ghost. We are done. It's not, oh, there is a ghost over there coming towards me. They are terrified. They are scared. We've all had that fear. We all know what it's like to be that surprised. But imagine that surprise not ending until Jesus says in verse 27, guys, don't be afraid, it's me. The Greek here says, guys, I am. Now we all understand that term, I am. We see it used in the uh, Exodus story with Moses. He says, tell, you, tell them that I am is coming. You know, he used it at uh, the Garden of Gethsemane and says, he says, I am. And the guards and everyone falls over. Here he is proclaiming who he is. But more importantly, he says, guys, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. And this term, don't be afraid, is used over 21 times in the Bible. And one of the greatest examples is in Joshua 1.9. Joshua 1.9. If you want to, you can turn there with me. Joshua 1.9. Joshua chapter 1, verse 9. It says, Have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. See, this, this term, do not be afraid, every time it's used, it's used with God is with you. God is with you. Do not be afraid. God is on your side. Do not be afraid. God is here. Do not be afraid. God is fighting for you. This term, do not be afraid, is always associated with God being with you. So Jesus is saying, guys, it's me, the Lord. Don't be afraid. Now, verse 28, this is what Peter says. And Peter said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. Now, this has gotten some bad press. Because it sounds like you're saying, Jesus, if it is you, Jesus, if it's you, tell me to come and walk toward you. That's not what's happening. The Greek here should be translated, since it is you, command me to come to you. Now that changes it, doesn't it? It's not questioning. It's making a declaration. Since it's you, he heard who Jesus, he heard his voice, knew who it was. And said, since it's you, I want to be with you, Jesus. I want to be with you. And then we have it, command me to come to you. See, Peter understood. Peter understood that the only way for Peter himself to walk to Jesus was <coughs> the power of the Lord. Because he knew he did not have the ability to walk on water. But he knew Jesus commanded him to. He would be using his authority to walk on the water to visit Jesus. And what did Jesus say in verse 29? Come on out. I give you permission to walk on water. I give you the ability to walk on water. Come. What did Peter do in verse 30? He hopped out of the boat. He didn't hesitate. He didn't go, well, he just hopped on out. Imagine what the other disciples were doing at this time. Thinking, ah, here's Peter putting his foot in his mouth once again. Thinking, man, we're going to see this guy drown. Or they're going, Peter, don't do it. It is a storm. This is not the right thing to do. What does Peter do? He heard Jesus' command. He obeyed Jesus. He hopped out. But then, what did Peter do? Verse 30. He looked around at his surroundings. He looked inward at what he was able to do and realized, you know what? There's a storm going on. I can't walk on water and start to sink. And in verse 31, this is what it says. Jesus immediately reached out and took hold of him, saying, Oh, you of little faith, why do you doubt? Oh, you of little faith. One, we don't know how far Peter walked. Jesus is immediately right there. Does that mean that Jesus ran over to Peter? Or does it mean that Peter was walking pretty far out, looked back at the boat, went, what is going on? Either that, 
those don't matter. What matters is this. When Peter was in trouble, who was there to help him? Jesus. Immediately. Not, well, let's see how he does. Immediately. Boom, right there. The second Peter died, where was Jesus? Right there to help him out. He cried out, Jesus, help me. And Jesus was like, hey, I got you. They climbed back on the boat. The seas were still, and they worshiped the Lord. There's three things that we see in this passage. There's three things I want to point out to us that I think apply to us directly. The first is know the master. The second is obey the master. And finally, we need to keep our eyes on the master. See, Peter knew the master. When Jesus said, it is I, don't be afraid, Peter heard his voice and knew the man. He said, that's Jesus, I know him. See, Peter spent time with Jesus. Altogether, it's estimated about two to three years of personal interaction on a daily basis with Jesus that the disciples had. Imagine eating breakfast, lunch, and dinner with Jesus. Joking around with Jesus. Jesus was a perfect man, so his humor had to be perfect. That meant his timing on jokes, spot on. <laughs> See, we imagine Jesus walking around, oh, you are healed. Oh, that's not what Jesus was. He was a carpenter, which meant he worked with stone and wood, so he was huge. He was a big, buff guy. But he also had the perfect emotions. He had perfect humor. He had perfect hair. He had perfect teeth. He was perfect. Every emotion, every feeling, everything that we have as humans, Jesus had. And so when they were walking together, it was not a solid group of guys. It was guys joking around. Think about when you get together with your close friends. Do you guys have inside jokes? Do you guys have funny stories that you tell each other? Of course we do. Jesus would have had the same interaction as 12 disciples. Not only that, Peter was on in the inner circle. So he had inside jokes that the other disciples didn't even know. See, he had an intimate knowledge of Jesus. He knew who Jesus was. He knew his voice. We also need to know our master. Now, we do not have the ability to spend three years with Jesus. But we have something a lot better. We can spend every day with the Lord through the Word of God. Let's turn back to Joshua chapter 1. We're going to look at Joshua 1 verse 8. If we want to know the Master, it starts out with reading the Bible. If we want to know the Master, it starts out with the Word of God. Joshua 1.8 says this. <coughs> Joshua 1.8 This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it, for then you will have, make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. This book of law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night. Why do we do this? Why do we meditate on it day and night? So that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will, have, you will make your way prosperous, and you will have good success. We need to be in the Word. We need to be people of the book. We need to read the Bible day and night. You need to memorize Scripture. You need to think about what you're memorizing. You need to study the Word of God. If you want to know the Master, this Bible that you have in your hand better be opened every day and night. There is no excuse. No excuse if you're not reading the Word of God. How many Christians say, you know, I'm just really struggling right now. Well, when was the last time you read the Bible? Oh, you don't understand. I have to wake up early. Is your spirituality so weak you cannot break the chains of sin? Is your spirituality so weak it cannot break the chains of sleep? John, you don't understand. I'm busy. I'm important. I have to get up early. I have to go do this. And by the time I go back to bed, I'm exhausted. I have no time for the Word of God. How's your favorite sports team doing? Oh, man. 
they just trade this new player. We may know all about our favorite sports team. We may be able to follow our favorite TV show. Oh, but we don't have time for the Word of God. If we want to know the Master, if we want to recognize His voice, we need the Word of God in our lives. We need to make our way prosperous by reading the Bible. Not just once. Oh, I've read three verses today. Got my Jesus. No. Meditate on it day and night. All day. Now that doesn't mean we walk around like crazy people with our Bible in front of us. You know, if I do that, I fall off this ledge and be on the ground and I'll be here next week lying on the ground. It'll be horrible. I wouldn't have showered and in a bad situation for everyone involved. God doesn't want us to do that. Have you ever thought that when you read a chapter in the morning, pick out a verse that stuck out to you and think about that, and try to memorize it throughout the day, and then at night reread that passage? Read a passage in the morning, another passage at night. Think about what God is telling you. When I say, when the Bible says meditate, it's a chewing over. Think about a cow chewing cud. Takes some food, swallows it, later on, regurgitates it, chews on a little bit more, and throughout the day is chewing on that same mouthful of food all day. That's how we should treat the Bible. I know it's kind of a gross analogy, but I won't lie, it's kind of gross. I worked at ranches for many years, but that's exactly what's going on here. That's exactly what we're supposed to do. Also, turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. We're going to look at verse 16 and 17. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. That the man of God may be competent, equipped for every good work. Do you realize that when we know the Master, we're fully equipped as Christians. When we read the Word of God, the only way to know the Master is through the Word of God. When we read the Word of God, it says this, ready? It's for training in righteousness that the man of God may be competent, equipped for every good work. Every good work. That we may be competent, equipped. The only way to be competent and equipped is through the Bible. If you want to know the Master, you need to read the Word of God. You cannot know the Master, you cannot be one with the Master without reading the Bible. Peter knew, knew the Master. Do you know the Master? Second thing is <coughs> obey the Master. When Jesus said to Peter, come, what did Peter do? <coughs> he came. He hopped out of the boat, started walking towards Jesus. There was instant obedience. When I was a camp counselor, I had a little term for disobedient little campers. Delayed obedience is disobedience. See, we, we many times want to think that, you know what, Jesus asked me to do something, and you know what, when I'm ready, I will go do it, and that's acceptable. Delayed obedience is disobedience. When my dad would tell me to mow the lawn, and I got to it a couple days later, he wasn't, well, son, I'm so proud of you, you mowed the lawn. No, that night, I got a book. He was like, why didn't you mow the lawn? I asked him to mow the lawn. Well, Dad, you know, I'm going to get to it this week, and you know what? I'm going to obey you. No, that, that was not part of the conversation. He would either take off his belt, get a switch from the yard, and you tan my hot. Because I, my obedience was delayed. See, we have to understand that delayed obedience is disobedience. When God asks us to do something, we need to do it immediately. Look at Matthew 28. And this actually goes along with our Sunday school lesson now, as they've been sitting. 
Matthew 28. What is God asking us to do? What do we need to do to obey God? Matthew 28, starting in verse 19. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Now there's many things in there, but you know what the, the point of this passage is? We are to go out and make disciples. We are to witness to people. We are to see them come to know the Lord. And then we are to train them up on what God wants them to do. What does God ask Christians to do? What does God want Christians to be like? We are to disciple people. We are to disciple people. You can't disciple people without winning them to the Lord. You need a witness to people. And then, you don't just save them and leave them. Let lead them to the Lord and then bring them to church and show them what it does it mean to be a Christian. Good times, bad times. One of the greatest men in my life is Dr. Aaron Webb. And he made probably the worst decision a pastor could ever make. I was 21 years old and he uh, brought me in front of the church and asked them to vote me in as youth pastor. I would not have done that. But he took a chance on me. And what he did, he made a list of job requirements for me. And one of them was every Friday I was required to go to his house for the weekend. Now, he <coughs> promised home-cooked meals and a wonderful time. I'm like, you oh. living in an economy, economy apartment, working for Bible College, living off of scraps. I think I can do this. So every weekend, Friday afternoon, I'd show up at his doorstep. And he lived his life with me. When he would go to visitation, he would carry me along. When he would go to the store, I would go with him. I was his shadow. When he would read a book, he said, John, you're reading this book now. Well, I don't really know, John, you're reading this book right now. When he'd watch something on TV, I'd watch it with him. I was not allowed to go into the guest bedroom and hang out there. I was to be by his side all the time. Now, I thought that was weird at the time. But you know what I realized? He was showing me what it meant to be a pastor. What it meant to be a man of God. I saw him and his wife argue over the way to cook steak. I saw him argue about the sweater he wanted to wear and his wife refused to let him out of the house with it on. I saw what it meant to be a loving husband when his wife was sick. He discipled me through his life. See, we think discipleship is just bringing to church, and it's more than that. It's living our lives along with someone to show them what it means to be a Christian. It takes time, it takes dedication, it takes patience, but the reality is that's what God is asking us to do. Not only does He ask us to disciple people, He asks us to be doers of the Word. Turn with me to James chapter 1. James chapter 1. We're going to look at verse 22. In James chapter 1, 22, it says this. It says that we are... But be doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving yourself. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in the mirror, but he looks at himself and goes away, and at once forgets what he is like. But the one who looks at the perfect law, the law of liberty, and preserves and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. Now there's a lot going on in there. There's a lot of doer here, doer here. This is what it's saying. When you read the Word of God, apply it to your life. Don't just read it and forget it. Read it and do it. See, God asks us to witness. He asks all of us to be disciple makers. And then He says, generally, apply the Word of God to your lives. Now, how can you apply the Word of God if you do not read the Word of God? See, it's all interconnected. We need to know the Master, and then we need to obey the Master. How can we obey the Master if we do not know the Master? How can we train someone on how to be a Christian if we don't read the Bible to know how to be a Christian ourselves? If we're to be 
fully equipped to be a doer of the word, we need to, one, to read the word. We need to know the master. We need to obey the master. Finally, we need to keep our eyes on the master. We need to keep our eyes on the master. It's not enough to know him. It's not enough to obey him. We now need to keep our eyes on him. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, starting verse 9, But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore I will boast all the more gladly of my weakness, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. You know why we have to keep our eyes on the Master? Because our strength is not enough to do what God is asking us. If you think you have the ability to do what God is asking you to do, you're going to fail. And you're going to fail miserably. And you're going to hurt a lot of people as you fall. See, God is asking us to do things that we are not able to do. What He is asking you to do is beyond your capabilities. God knows that. And that's why He says, hey, my grace is sufficient for you. What I'm asking you to do, you can't do it. But I got your back. I'm supporting you. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26 and 29. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you are wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even the things that are not, to bring to nothing the things that are, so that no human being may boast in the presence of God, and God of Him. And because of Him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that it is written, Let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. The reason we don't have what it takes to do what God asks us is so that when we do do it, we can point to the Lord and say, look what God was able to do through me. How powerful and wonderful is God? Look at the grace of God. If He could do this through me, imagine what He could do through you. See, everything God wants us to do is to point glory back to Him. So He's going to ask you to do something that you're like, I really can't do this. God said, yeah, I know, but I got you back. You also have to look at Romans 8.31. Romans 8.31. It says this, What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? If God is asking you to do something, He's giving you the ability to do it. Not only that, He's saying, you know what? I am for you. Nothing is going to work against you. They may try to bring you down, but hey, trust me, I'm for you, so no one, nothing can stand against you. Not only that, further down in Romans 8, starting verse 35, it says, What shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger of the sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all day long, we are regard, we regard as sheep led to the slaughter. Knowing all these things, we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. See, when God asks you to do something, what He does is He gives you the backing of the Creator of the universe. So you can do it. There's a TV show in the 80s called He-Man. I was not allowed to watch He-Man. I wanted to watch He-Man, but He had a saying that my parents said I couldn't watch him. He said, by the power of the universe, I am He-Man. And he had a sword, a glowed, his tiger became a fighting tiger. It was quite the show. But see, he said, through the power of the universe, I am He-Man. And he was able to do almost anything. Do you realize that we are He-Mans? Do you realize that you, apparently he had a sister, Shira, you are Shira. You, you're, you're, you know He-Man. You're not, and I see that. There's Shira and there's He-Man. We are them. Do you realize you have the power of the universe standing behind you? When God says, 
Go tell the person at Walmart about me. The creator of the universe is standing behind you with a hedge of protection, allowing you to share his word. And then how many times you say, oh, no, I can't do that. God says to you, go work with the youth. The universe, the creator of the universe is standing there saying, I have all the tools of creation at your disposal to work with the youth. And you're like, oh, I, I can't do that. You know what you're really saying? God, you're not enough for me. God, you do not have the tools I need to be successful. Now, we would never say that, right? We'd say, oh, God, that's just not true. We say that with our actions all the time. God is asking each and every one of us to do something. Every one of us in this room, God is saying, I want you to do this. And for the most part, we say yes. But there's that one thing that you're saying no to. There's that one thing that God is asking you to do that you're like, I just don't know. We're disobeying God. We're forgetting that the power of the universe is standing behind us. We're looking at all the weaknesses that we have, all the problems that might be. Instead, we should be keeping our eyes on the Master. When Peter looked at his problems around him, what did he do? He sank. But when he kept his eyes on the Master, he walked on water. Today in this room, there's a couple different kinds of people. There might be a person who does not know the Master. They're not saved. You may be sitting here and you have never made a profession of faith. Jesus Christ died on the cross for you so that you may be born again. <clears throat> See, we are all sinners. God loved us so much that while we were yet sinners, He died for us. He died for you. He said, I want to take your sins and carry that burden for you. All we need to do is accept this sacrifice and we will be saved. If you're here today and you've never made a profession of faith, I want to encourage you, let me introduce you to the Master. Or, you're a Christian, but you don't know the Master because you don't read the Word of God. You might be a Christian, but you don't know the Master because you're not reading His Word. How can you do what He's asking if you don't recognize His voice? Do you know the Master? Then there's a third person. The person that knows the Master, but is not obeying. He knows what the Master is asking him to do, but he's looking at all the problems, or she's looking at all the problems and saying, well, I can't do this. I'm not able to do this. Where are you today? Is, are you doing what God has asked you to do, or are you holding back? Are you reading the Word of God to know the Master? If you want to have success in doing what God has called you to do, you need to know the Master, you need to obey the Master, and you need to keep your eyes on the Master. In a second, I'm going to pray. My invitation is simply this. It's twofold. If you're not a Christian, and you're hearing this for the first time, that Jesus died for you, come forward. Let me share with you the wonderful love of our Lord. Second is this. Maybe you're sitting here and you're a Christian and you don't know the Master or you're not obeying the Master. Come forward and give yourself over to looking solely at the Lord. Maybe you need to come forward and say, you know what, I'm going to make a commitment to read the Bible every day. Or maybe it's, you know what, God is asking me to do something and I've been saying no and I need to say this. Don't leave here today thinking you can't do it. Don't leave here today not making a commitment to read the Word of God. Are you going to be a master of the universe? Or are you going to sink in the waves of death? <coughs> Let's pray. Father God, if there's anyone here who doesn't know you, Lord, please touch their heart that they will come forward and know you and get to know you. Your love for them. Or if there's a believer here that doesn't know you because they're not reading the word, let them make a commitment to know you by reading the word daily, night and day, 
so that they may hear your voice and obey you. Lord, if there's someone here who's not obeying you, that they're looking at the waves and the storm and are afraid, give them the courage to step out. Let them know you, obey you, and keep their eyes on you. 